Okay, the call is on. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, some students are missing. They will come. Great. Um, so it's time to, uh, it's, a, it's a, the last session of the day, of the week, and uh, on this topic from uh, EPIC, from narrative to uh, diplomacy and to cultural uh, uh, ideas. Hello, sir. So I will start first with my presentation and I hope we will, will have a, um, some time for, for discussion. Um, I do one hour and a half. Yes. Yes. Okay. So today I've made, I have a case from the Indian subcontinent. It means uh, different country which in, within this area. So here is from from Bush. Yeah, it's coming at 4:30. Oh, come. Well, we discussed it uh, some uh, days. Uh, we discussed it within this week. We discussed it within this week, but it's good to to give some uh, uh, content about this uh, famous nation, uh, famous notion about soft concerning soft power, public dip diplomacy and soft power. This is two sides of the same coin. And it was uh, framed by Joseph Nye. I don't know if we already discussed that. But um, soft power is com composed, according to him, about culture, political value, and foreign policy of one country. You're writing on your phone? Yeah. Never saw that before. Only in India. Welcome. Welcome. So I will start today my lecture about uh, something we have seen on the uh, precedent sessions about how to tell a story with cultural resources or political resources. In the academic field, it's called public diplomacy or soft power. Soft power is very famous because of Joseph Nye, and it's three elements which can be discussed, we don't have time, but which normally give a good framework. There is a lot of synonyms, like cultural diplomacy, sometimes advocacy, sometimes public relations. We already discussed, illustrate all the cases with that. So this field is a very, uh, intense now, very vibrant, because all the states decided, not decided, and all the states are competing for their image. All the states, even except one we mentioned two days before, which is North Korea. But there is a very, and Somalia, so, so such a state doesn't compete, but all the other ones are competing for that. So I give you some insight, uh, and then I give you two illustrations from the subcontinent as uh, similar for the session before. So, uh, for example, the China soft power, they decide to, twist, to transform resources into a diplomacy operation around a structured narrative. It was developed ten, uh, in 2000, broadly speaking, in 2010. We are in 2024. So they develop, they develop a story a st with different, different resources with one structured narrative. It's a very organized policy, as always in China, so it's quite interesting to analyze it. So it's based, it, of course, this is in French, and this uh, part is based on my book, and by a, a very nice uh, um, uh, combination, the graphic decided to choose the panda, which can be uh, considered as an icon of soft power. Because I don't know here about the zoo, but I have monitored the website of three different zoo uh, around my home, and all the website of the zoo put panda on the front on the front page to attract a family with the kids. Wow, it's too it's too too high. 
So the China decided to do that, and I will present you three different uh, dimensions with narratives. What is uh, interesting in, uh, in, in China is that the engaging narrative aimed at different audiences. They didn't forget different audiences, as we have mentioned yesterday and the day before. And there was a, they have a story into two topics. So I, I describe this in my book. And uh, the first one, of course, is the classical uh, discourses on soft power, which is culture. It's very, it's so obvious that it's, a, it's like a, a, a granted fact. We don't, we, have, we don't discuss about that. Alors, there is a list of different elements on soft power in the China disposal, which is not the same for India, not the same for France, not the same for all the countries. The Confucius Institute already mentioned it, it's like the French Alliance Francaise. There is a big, a big list of uh, media which are 100% uh, owned by the government and they receive directive from the government. You may uh, he have heard here in India CGTN, which is a, the Chinese uh, in English. So this is a voice of the government. Then they try also to develop blockbusters to compete with Hollywood, and the f there, is a, there is three here, and we can have a, a new one. The, this Great Wall with Matt Damon, uh, I don't know if you saw it? Yeah. Only one? Uh, it's supposed to, it was supposed to be a, a blockbuster. It was a huge flop. flop, huge all over the world. Because if you see this movie, you can, after five minutes, discover what is the next scene. So it's so, so, so obvious that it's, frankly speaking, I can say it's boring, but when I ask it to my Chinese students, they say, oh, that's boring too. So it's a proof of. You've got the wandering earth, which is something about ecology. You've got the wolf warrior, which is a fighting movies where uh, uh, um, China save its own citizen in a destroyed country somewhere in the Middle East. And there is a new one which will uh, appear about science fiction. So they try uh, the he knows everything. That's right. Can we reduce uh, the, the air? Um, uh, okay, but it's, it, we don't have any big proof of the success of that. Then, of course, we've got TCM, exactly as what we have here in the soft power of India, Ayurveda, and we have a proof of that. And, of course, you've got some discipline, exactly as yoga, Qigong, and Tai Chi Chuan. So you, you know Tai Chi, and it's all like this, like this, and Qigong, something more related with religion and Taoism. So, You already discussed about Wolf Warrior. Okay. So that's a narrative which says China is a big power, China is a friendly power, China could be, should be loved, or could be loved, as you, as you decide. Okay? Okay, we can put numbers behind that. We can put thousands of numbers, how many readers, how many practitioners, how many people are watching the movie, and, and how many people are doing Qigong or Tai Chi. It's less, but it's, uh, it's less popular than yoga in the West, but Tai Chi became also very popular in the Western world. So we can say it's a soft power of China. And it is. It was developed, into, it was developed under a very big frame policy because China is controlled by the government. China is under the rule of the party. So nothing should be, could be decided without that even artists, but we, who is able to, to quote one, and one Chinese artist in that room, except you? <laughs> who is able to quote one Chinese artist, except you? There is only one which is famous abroad, maybe two. If you know the second one, you are very clever. Huh? Are you able to quote any uh, Chinese artist? Fang Ping Ping? I don't know him. So he's able to. I don't know him. Huh? Ah, Jet Li is from Hong Kong. 
like Bruce Lee, he's from Hong Kong. Both are from Hong Kong, and before 2017, Hong Kong was still autonomous. Huh? Donnie, Donnie Ho? A singer? He's an actor. I don't know him. Okay, I don't know him. So in the West, we know mostly Ai Weiwei. Have you heard about him, Ai Weiwei? No. Okay, he's very famous in the West. He's very political, but now, after being beaten, after being uh, subdued, after, su uh, su uh, after having some trials, he's in exile in Portugal. He's an actor. No, he's an artist. Huh? A what? He's a yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah. I agree with that. He was in in exile in Berlin, and then he moved to Portugal. I don't know why. It's French. In, but very long time ago, in '72. Yeah, but he become French. And, and the other famous uh, um, uh, artist is Lou Charbot. He died in prison. He died in prison. So that's uh, how to evaluate soft power. We can discuss for hours. We don't have time. The second dimension is academic economic dimension. Of course, you have heard about the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. It doesn't go through China, it goes through your neighbor with a CPEC. Huh? Uh, what, is, what is that? Okay, this is economic development in, framed by Xi Jinping in 2013. 2013, and he said, we will connect the world for the benefit of the human mankind. If you read the text, if you read the discourses of Xi Jinping, all the value are inside. We will connect the world through uh, through uh, trade, through linkage, through digital um, uh, highways for the benefit of human mankind. It means that your country, your country, and your country will benefit of growth, happiness, and uh, trade. That's, uh, there is value behind that, of course. So, but there is a, uh, here is a huge connection. Huh? The most famous near from you are in Sri Lanka. You've got the Abantota Harbour. With, the, with some problem. Huh? Uh, I think yeah, the government has lose, lost the election partially due to that. Is that right? Am I right? Uh, uh, in Bhutan, I don't know. In Thailand, I don't know yet. But there is a train running from the side to Vietnam. And of course, your neighbor with the Gwadar uh, port. Huh? I mean, the Pakistan. But your neighbor, too, the other ones. <laughs> okay. So you've got different other initiatives with the same value promoted by China, the BRICS. So there was a five member, now there is 11 members. It's according to my research and to some other colleagues, it doesn't function, function quite well, but we don't care about the, the result. We care about the discourse. And the discourse is the same. The discourse is we will ch BRICS will challenge the global order face to the global or the global order dominated by the US. This is the same discourses. But who, have you heard here about the FOCAC? If we three years, there is a huge meeting between China and Africa, similar to do trade with, to do trade with China. Now here there is no African students, but if we discuss with African students, they say, oh yeah, China has built a new, uh, uh, um, uh, a new airport. Ah, China has built a new stadium. Oh, as China has built the new presi uh, presidency. So China is putting thousands of, of uh, uh, billions of yuan to do trade. Sometime with a uh, problem uh, with, huh? We know everything. Sometimes with debt trap diplomacy. When the, when the, you know, Sri Lanka, they were not able to pay the debt and they give the arbor for free 1,000 hectares huh? yeah. for 99 years. So it became Chinese territory. Can you imagine that? 
in your own country it became Chinese territory because your country is not able to pay the debt or the interest of the debt. It's, it's very strange. So then in Central Europe you've got another uh, um, um, group but it doesn't function clearly. Then you've got, we don't know the content, but researchers are uh, naming it Global Security Initiative and Global Development Initiative, but there is no uh, literature on that one. But research on, on belts and the bricks is quite intense. You, you, there is a BRI tracker to, sue, to see what, uh, what's going on. I don't want to discuss about the result. I want to discuss about the discourses always promoted by China. If, you trace, if your country trade with China, benefit for the human mankind. It could be discussed for hours, from, from debt to the local workers, from corruption to elite. Alors, we already discussed on that one, but it's to show that after the Chinese uh, uh, soft power, which is one narrative under different dim dimensions, there is also a lot of discussion on that through TikTok, through academic exchanges, exchanges and through think tanks. For example, I, I make a small bracket. Uh, uh, for example, I was attending uh, in my book, I describe all these Chinese events I have seen in Brussels, organized by the Chinese mission. And there was a, there was a, a, a meeting in an in a, in a open space where uh, a, a Chinese professor were giving books of Confucius thoughts to the library. So imagine here, the library received for free books published by the, published by the Chinese for the library to, to be more accustomed to the, to the Chinese thoughts, especially Confucianism, which is, as you may know, a, theory, a theory of global order, social order, from the bottom to the top, from the top to the bottom. So it gives you some thousands of, and there is thousands of initiatives like this on a daily basis thousands in the world, even in here in the capital in, uh, in New Delhi, and in, in very my capital in Brussels, or my, home, not my hometown, they say, they say, let's do like this, uh, Paris. So this is the Chinese dimension. So I already discussed that, that India have tried to do the same with one, only one point, which is culture. So this is one uh, point. Then I can move to the other dimension. This case is quite long to explain, so I'm quite hesitating, but to show you to make some connection with the rest of my different days and for the new ones to connect it. You remember we discussed about intangible cultural heritage? So the French decide to, here it's called a gastronomic meal of the French. The French inscribe this to the UNESCO heritage list in 2010 on presidential request in 2008, and then French organized thousands of events during several years, public all over the world, French Embassy Network, and International Forum on Gastronomy in Paris. Just to show you that each country can choose one topic, China has chosen Panda and Confuci Confucianism, to make it short, to make it short, and French has chosen French gastronomy, not French food, not a cheese or papaya, but French way of eating to, uh, to organize an event at the worldwide level, at the worldwide level, just to, to increase the number, to, to make people in contact with French food. Alors, there were events, there was event here, uh, maybe it's uh, in the Versailles, there were events at the French Embassy in Delhi. There were events not in Rajgir, but may, they may have events in the French restaurant uh, or, or, or restaurants which, are pro, which agree to register on the list uh, in China, in India, uh, or uh, maybe in the US, because I, I know that you are US, you are US citizen, right? Yes, we are. Okay. We confuse the French lunch. Yeah, so there, there is a reputation like this. And the goal was not to promote French image. The goal was to attract more tourists. Very concrete results. 
because France is the third biggest destination in the world. The first one is US, the second one is Spain, and the third one, we are competing with Spain. So we are each day, each, each year, Spain, France, Spain, France, 90 million of tourists. How many, how many citizens in France? Huh? Five to ten. what? Fifty to hundred millions of citizens in France. Yeah, it's a huge uh, <laughs> range. Be more precise. No, don't look at your internet. <laughs> Sixty-five million. So we now. Yeah, sixty with a uh, with a uh, uh, outside. Uh, Dom Tom with uh, uh, overseas, overseas territory. Seven, 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 so 67 million, 90 million tourists. It's huge. It's a huge of money, and it's also uh, concrete jobs. So French choose gastronomy food the, to promote the image of France and to increase the number of tourists, which is a concrete line. You know how the line is organized? from one resources to one strategy to one goal. Yoga has done the same, but it doesn't bring, I, I don't know if it brings thousands of pra pra practitioners in India, because you, you mostly practice on a daily basis near your house in, in Buenos Aires or in, in uh, Bangkok. So there is no, the articulation is less visible. And the articulation of Chinese is not for bringing more tourists in China, it's to provide, promote alternative as, uh, vision, dimension of the world. The, to promote the Chinese system as an alternative one, to challenge the, the, the universal value promoted by the so-called West. Yeah, but, but I agree with your words, but if, you, if I was asking, uh, 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 when I practicing yoga in Europe, I'm sometimes asking the teacher, did you went to India? Yes, that's what they no, are And the answer is less than 20%. Exactly, yes. But they have many of them are Well, that's true, but it's... it's Yeah, but, but it, it became, they are still uh, competing together, <laughs> despite, despite the change of the, 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 the thing. I, I think so. Not a lot of, because uh, if it becomes more marketized, they don't feel the need to go to India. If they want to go to traditional stuff, like the Ayurveda, we have strength, okay, we go. But if you just do marketing with a, a very, uh, you know, you, you know the, the, the uh, yoga courses, now there are uh, 8 p.m. this, 9 p.m. this, 10 p.m. this, uh, 10, uh, it's just like uh, boxes. And all the teachers are, are uh, running, it's not the same teacher, it's just a, a kind of, uh, an, an office. Huh? Yeah, center of, center of yoga. And they are demystifying yoga. No, they are no, not demystifying. They, they, they put it in a more um, um, uh, healthy dimension. Yes, yes. So I've taken the you know, yoga courses here in, in Rishikesh. That's right, that's the right. The well, there is no judgment on that. Huh? There is no, it's just evolution of practices. But it shows that sometimes the soft power or the policy of one state doesn't give the result which is uh, 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 wanted, or which is targeted, okay? 
Actually, yes. Can you call that uh, Flock Flockstar player in Oxford University of Manitoba? So he is one of the like, leading scores of yoga. Now he is uh, very old, very old. But so he gave this kind of a research and he says that in maybe in 70s, lots of people, hippie movement, Westerners were coming. But now he gives this uh, concludes that there is no need of going to India. Exactly. Well, that's why soft power doesn't uh, always function, and that's why we can criticize. At least, uh, uh, in this has, for the French case, it has functioned, and it was stopped just after the COVID in 2020, and there is no more policy from the French government. And it wasn't costing a lot of money because it wasn't done on a voluntary basis. But okay, it's, it's already, I, I like this idea because it's a, Intangible heritage, like we have seen yesterday, the ball songs, or some days ago, and then it's a, a way to transform it into resource and resources, and then a way to promote the image of France, and with a concrete goal to gain tourists. I like this uh, articulation. The Chinese case is not that one. The Chinese case is more to promote the vision of China. You may yes. Yeah. Well, this is why they developed uh, the BRI. If we look at the BRI in a critical manner, we can spot on the map that they are, they are, uh, they are targeting uh, countries where there are raw materials or energy. This is really clear. They don't target Egypt, they don't target uh, 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 Togo, they target countries where they can explore, uh, make raw materials. So that's why uh, researchers have called this approach Neo-imperialism, neo-imperialism of China, which China is not ready to hear, of course, <laughs> because they say we do that for the benefit of human mankind. Uh, we are very, very peaceful with all of you. We are do that for human mankind. But what is the I also. Uh, yeah, but not with not with not not label under the, not label in, uh, under these discourses. As far as I know, no. She says that uh, all the power do the same, and I argue, I reply that um, not with the same argument. Where the benefit of human is? mankind. But no, because no, because if we look at the discourses, which is a key point of my lecture, the discourses in more importance of is, should be separated from the policy. Yes. Otherwise, we we mix everything. Okay, so uh, here is an illustration of the, well, um, in French, but the illustration of the uh, Good Friends operation with, uh, uh, of course, on Facebook, and uh, here is uh, Ambassador de Francia, and okay, that's uh, something you, you, you know. Uh, so, now today, image formation and communication. So, the, this is uh, the, the summary and the one of the first conclusion of my week, and this very, very uh, nourishing week here, uh, states stick to maximize the perception of their quality to international audiences. Please consider that as a fact. You like it or you dislike it, it's not important. All the states do that, even Bhutan. We will see in a few, in a few minutes. Image building, often cultural artifacts because it's the easiest way and a narrative we have a discourse it's called it's it could be labeled as a marketing okay i, di I don't have problem with that but it's a it's a fact of it's a fact of politician or political communication today so we, we make easily a connection between epic narrative and political communication today 
One, it was suggested by Professor Shushan, soft power and public diplomacy equal modern day epic, with quite a funny balance between the two, the two dimensions. But uh, uh, if I uh, read once again the list of your uh, still, sometimes the states may use one, some epic or some part of the epic to frame into a foreign policy. Why not? Why not? Maybe uh, let's say King Geza. Maybe Bhutan, because has not so many resources, can use King Geza as something for the new policy. Why not? There is no judgment on that. Maybe it's, uh, if we say we are the most powerful, in that case, it's, uh, it's, it's a certain content of violence. But it could be, it's so possible. Then it should be adapted, adapted to international audiences, of course. Like the one, uh, uh, the, the one, uh, Kiyata Hase. Maybe it's too far from many references all over the world in that case. But at least one state can, can not should, can. Well, Bhutan. Bhutan and branding. Even Bhutan have done something. How I discover that? So let me give you some minutes. I was invited to the embassy of Bhutan in Brussels. I am in contact with that. This is the only embassy, only embassy, the only embassy of Bhutan plus London in the Western world. They will only have two embassies. Brussels, because of the European Union, and London, because of English-speaking heritage. So what do they do? I was invited here. So we were less than 20 people, which is very small, because Bhutan is not so, let's say, popular for the Western audience. And what do they do? So here is a big audience. They propose a new branding for the country. So we, I, I, we didn't see it. I received a video which was uh, done in Timpu under the uh, framework of the uh, branding uh, 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 American uh, enterprise. Why not? But they, and they propose a new approach to promote uh, uh, Bhutan. It's quite okay. okay. It's oriented towards, uh, towards tourism but also, also image. So they reinterpret the traditional icons of, uh, of Buddhism. They reinterpret, which is quite already clever. So they reinterpret the motif. They, they propose here uh, some documents free uh, to promote the ID. They propose a big leaflet. I, I didn't bring it, I should have made some photo. They propose a big uh, leaflet in, in, in printed. And what was on this leaflet? Young ones. Faces of young ones. What, is, what was the message? The future of the nation. All the, all the faces on the leaflet were above 25. So it means the future of the nation. Well done, well done. And, and what was the more, uh, what, what was also promoted? Uh, uh, there was some uh, reinterpretation of Buddhism images, okay? Yes, ah, yeah, now I remember. Uh, they say, uh, be, uh, I don't remember the slogans, but uh, Bhutan, a Buddhist country. Something about Bhutan, in Bhutan, Buddhism is still living. Oh, if you do that for the Western world, oh, Buddhism is still living. Oh, I will try to get to Bhutan. Okay, it's for according to the taxes, you know, for, to enter to Bhutan is two hundred and fifty euro dollars per day. Come on, come on, it's so expensive. No, 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 per day. No one of us can afford it. Huh? No one of us can afford it. But at least they reach to try to reach high uh, income uh, tourists. But it was all. What do the resource, what other resources they have? Mountains, okay. But if you want to do mountaineering, you can, you can do everywhere. But Buddhism, it, it's quite a good strategy to illustrate the country. So reinterpreting the traditional images, promoting, Bud, Buddhist, uh, tr promoting the young ones as the future of the nation, and enfantizing, 
Tu vois une phrase Non, non, tu... Euh, 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 Insister. Emphasizing. Emphasizing on, on, the, on Buddhism values. Because also countries which promote a uh, Buddhism value may be seen by many uh, other countries as peaceful. Basically, Buddhism is peaceful. You, you may not, difficult to disagree with that. But of course, all the region is peaceful. But Buddhism is peaceful. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Well, it's more economical. Is this more economical dimension? As a Buddhist ID, I know that also they promote it uh, heavily abroad, the G and H, and they promote it as a, uh, let's say, soft power. We have con created something new, which is not based only on money and capitalism, which is quite clever. So a few, re the, no, how many inhabitants in, in, Bu in Bhutan? 400,000? 700? Huh? 2.7? No, it's 700,000. Yeah, that's what I say. Yeah, 700,000. So for a country like this, they succeed to at least to pop up three values. G and H, Buddhism, and um, maybe the young ones, or something like this. Or eco-tourism. So it's, every, it's possible for every country. It depends on the history. It, it is not possible for every country, right? Because if they have less population for ecology, for that happiness, it is easier to distribute the source and... Hello. Uh, <coughs> you should be a PhD in the topic. I'm ready to, uh, to support, uh, to, to, to make a, a joint PhD between France and India with you on that topic. Uh, why do I, I laugh like this? Because, because, ah, yes, everything, all the study shows that middle-sized country are, have more chance to do a, a, a successful soft power policy. It's easier to do. The country normally is well managed or better managed. There is less, uh, less um, uh, different stakes or different challenges. Uh, you can focus on three or four articles and you are not competed by other ones. Of course, if you are China, Russia, France, or UK, all nations, big nations, considered as big power, this, those countries are challenged by, uh, by different partners. Middle-sized middle nations, it's easier for them. So Sri Lanka has a chance. Uh, Bhutan can make it. And of course, the success of Qatar. How many inhabitants? 0.4. So middle-sized countries have more chance to do that. And we see by looking at rankings that middle-sized countries are always on the top because it's easier to manage, like Sweden, Norway, Norway Denmark, which are less than 10 million. Yes. Okay, let's move. So now, uh, I, this is the second part after Bhutan. We go to an, another neighbor, the so famous neighbor of India, which is Sri Lanka, and also, can we uh, frame a country by using indexes? Yes, we can. So I told you about that different indexes. Soft power indexes, there is three major ones in the world. And here, I have made a case study on Pakistan. You know, the so famous neighbor of uh, India. So I have made a case study, and of course, I don't have time to do on that. It's a mixed methodology. You may browse on the website. You may browse on the, on the Global Soft Power Index 2023-2023. And they do online survey. And they do, they monitor 35 attributes in 12 pillars. So, 
We don't go into detail except if you ask questions. And here we find, here, oh la la. Ah. Here we find Pakistan is ranking 84, 84, and it was ranking 83. So he has lost one place between 2002 and 2022 and 2023. Okay, so all the countries are ranking. Uh, frankly speaking, you find easily on the top uh, um, uh, Nordic European countries or countries such as Canada, which is medium-sized countries. And here you find uh, Pakistan. What? Medium size country when you say is it the population? Uh, population. population. Then uh, I choose another index which is a worldwide level, which is a, a, a rule, rule of law index. So it shows how the quality of the governance of one country. And then we have different countries here, and we find again uh, Pakistan rank 129 among 140 countries which are monitored, which is not a very good position huh? because of uh, a problem of governance, fundamental rights, order, security, civil and criminal justice. So this is a, 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 a research center which is doing the same research on every country through databases according to their criteria. We may challenge the criteria, we don't have time, but at least uh, in my methodology, I take four different indexes. And if we find the same country at the same ranking, it means something. Huh? Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Let, frankly speaking, we are at the, not so far at the bottom of the list. Huh? You see this country, uh, Iran, uh, Republic Democratic of Congo, which is total chaos. Uh, Ethiopia, which is uh, like this, Sudan, but bref. Bangladesh is not very well ranked too. Okay, we don't discuss that. Then, the Pakistan, what they try to do? They try to send their image, but one a friend of mine labeled it as a proto-public proto diplomacy, something before. It's not so well done, not so mature than the Chinese one, the Buddha one, the Indian one, it's not so mature. They try, they just realize that they have to change. So for example, uh, alors, even in the front of the camera, it's not a secret, uh, I had the chance to go to Pakistan this year in, in two months ahead. So I have to apply for a visa. And what do they show? They show mountains. So they, they try to already frame their image by using different images, like a natural landscape, of course, the Hindu Kuch, it's, it's incredible to see Hindu Kuch, like the Himalaya, of course, huh? on government on governmental website and social account, it's a kind of primary resources. But they don't clearly, they make a mix up be between branding and tourism. It's not clear. It, may, it shows that there is no strategy. They are, they are, they are, they, okay, we know something, we have to do better. They know that, they have to do better. But there is no strategy. If there is no strategy, there is a lack of results and there is a lack of narrative. In my article that will be published soon, I, I, I argue that, that there is no narrative, credible, no credible narrative for Pakistan, which shows that they are not doing properly the job. And I hope that I will not be judged in front of the camera by the, such an argument. So I have monitored the public diplomacy. They, they created a, a, a Twitter account, which is already a good idea, a, a, a X account. And so I have made a monitoring. I don't go into detail, but 40% of the posts devoted to cultural education, 8% about cricket and mountaineering, 25 about landscapes, 9% economic relations, Four diplomatic activities, 16 religious sites dedicated to, uh, with, a dedicated, with a dedicated hashtag, uh, explore Pakistan. So they already try to also to do that. And here, uh, for example, it's a, a Mantal Buddha rock somewhere uh, in Pakistan. 
and they promote, which is quite good, they promote Catholic places, Jain places, Hindu places. So they, they, they realize that they don't want to be framed into a 100% uh, uh, Muslim country, Islamic country, with a kind of rigid, rigidness, can we say so? Rigidity. And they, they develop some argument slowly on the Twitter account with promoting, uh, they promote artists that no one has ever heard, so that's not a good strategy, frankly speaking. But this is the most efficient to at least promote. Uh, uh, and here, there is a kind of uh, layout which is easy, easily rec recognizable. So even me, when I was, because I don't know Pakistan in detail, uh, uh, even when I was doing this research, I discovered that they were promoting Catholic Catholicism, Hinduism, Jainism, because before the partitions, the, all these uh, 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 religions and all these faiths were spread all over the subcontinent. So it's slowly emerging, but without a clear, uh, frankly speaking, explore Pakistan is not, a, is, not, is not a narrative, it's just a tourist branding. So take your flight, take your bus, or take your uh, 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 guide and explore Pakistan. There's a reason, okay, oh, Pakistan is nice. That's all, it's more tourism. They make a mix between the two. And I would have liked to have, a, when I was there, proposing, I proposed a, to meet one senior official at the MFA, because I, I had the chance to be in contact, and unfortunately, unfortunately he didn't reply, reply to my proposal. I was so busy that he didn't have time. Okay, Buddhism for image building. And we have seen already uh, on the second day, a resource for public diplomacy for tourism to providing a more subtle image. I already argued on that on the second day on the cases of, of different countries here. But here, for example, of course, we have seen the, uh, the, the Buddhist uh, uh, tour uh, in, here in, in, uh, in Bihar and in India. There is similar stuff in, uh, in, in Nepal why not similar uh, uh, activities for, um, uh, for Pakistan? Because of what? If I am a tourist and I come back, oh, have you visited uh, mountains? No, I visited Buddhist site. Come on, you change the image of, of the country one after the other. Of course, here we are speaking about uh, tourists, but if you do the same on website, if you do the same on events, if you do the same on, on Twitter, on, on, on accounts, then you can reach different uh, audiences. One point, as India, the Pakistan embassy do nothing in Brussels. Nothing. No event at all, except on invitation, invitation only between diplomats, traditional diplomacy. But it's not visible. It's incredible. The Korean, I told you, the Korean case, it's open on a daily basis. Uh, the Chinese case, before the COVID, it was open on a daily basis, not the embassy. You never go to an embassy like this, no. Oh. But the, they, they rent a room, they rent some places into the center, and they, they make something for general public. India and Pakistan do nothing in Brussels. Sri Lanka is more active. They promote uh, economic interest. At the occasion of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs visit in Brussels for a big event with, uh, with the European Commission, they rent uh, a room and they make a promotion of two hours of doing business with Sri Lanka towards European citizens. And they promote, of course, tourism, of course, tea, and of course, uh, different um, uh, activities. But they do it slowly. The narrative should be, could be more articulated. Buddhist heritage and email building, resource and attraction in the development of dialogues and communication with country in Buddhist tradition, okay? In terms of public diplomacy, uh, I don't know if you are aware about the art of Gandhara. Uh, of course, of course you. <laughs> Uh, and the Buddhist scenes in Taxila and the Suede Valley represent an, interest, represent an interesting avenue. 
And the conclusion, if the process is carried out in a coherent manner, contribution to dissemination of the other gandera inside and abroad. Alors, my intuition, uh, that art of gandara will be pop up within the, the next year, 2025, at the worldwide level, because Pakistan wants to use it. You know, the art of gandara is only in Pakistan. Very few in Afghanistan. And on, uh, less in, uh, in Uzbekistan. So Uzbekistan don't care about it. But uh, I think that if the art of Gandhara is used as a, something which can be promoted inside the country for tourism and outside the country as a, uh, as a contribution for the image, then it could, it could change the image of Pakistan. And I've been told that when I was in, in Pakistan for an academic conference, there was a guy himself, he was himself, he said, he was a, he was a scholar, he said, a, a leader of the um, research institute on Gandhara in Islamabad. He said himself, this year it's incredible. There is four conferences on Gandhara art on the same year, which for a very small topic, very specialized topic for archaeologists and historians, it's very, very important. It shows that uh, there is something which is going on. You're browsing about Gandhara art? Uh, no, no, it's doing a, it's growing in something else. Yeah. Um, in recent time, all of uh, Pakistani bloggers have been going to visit places and they are uh, making blogs. All the famous uh, millions of subscribers are uh, Pakistani bloggers. Yeah. It's possible? <laughs> <laughs> What did you do while not in the classroom? You're on your smartphone by looking for information on international relations on a, on a, on a daily basis? Okay. So it shows that his algorithm is working well. <laughs> I like to, to, to joke with you. I'm not kidding you. Here is an image of the conference. So it's a second international conference on art festival and the Buddhist heritage. Heritage for peace and progress. Okay, it's not narrative, it's just a title of one conference. But just to, you, you get the point by all your contribution that it works, whatever the country is, it works. And uh, it was supported by a, a, a Buddhist uh, um, um, network. Organization. Uh, yeah, this is a nun, but she represents she represents the organization. And here is a is a is a uh, uh, the the former prime minister of uh, of uh, no the former uh, ministry of uh, culture of uh, of Pakistan. And here I told you one of the ten people in the world speaking fluently Kavoshti, a German guy. He speaks French, Kavalchi, he reads Kavalchi like you read English and Hindi. Incredible. We were only two Westerners. Uh, so they already propose uh, 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 different routes. This, this is not very good, but ancient Gadara, a dynamic journey. This presentation was, was done on, a, uh, on they was framed in a touristic manner. Touristic tourism, touristic on the field. But, okay, that's already done. And the, the, the presenter was the highest quality of the whole conference. He know everything how to organize and to, to create some, um, uh, how can I say, opening up some movement around Gandhara because he was in charge of tourism and museum in the region. Okay, then, like here, we have to do the traditional photo, group photo, group photo, group photo. So at every place we've made a group photo. And of course, they choose already something which is okay, okay tourism, welcome to the land of Gandhara. So it's already something. If they do that through social media, 
they can reach outside. If they do that on their website, but if they do that on their social media with a connection between MFA, tourism, and other, uh, let's say, uh, two influencers or two bloggers, then slowly, in five, we start with, after five years, it can spread slowly. So on each places we were, we were, we were, and they were, they, they were uh, a photographer specialized in doing photo for the, the agency. Well, okay, I don't think, I'm not, then I finished, I finished at, uh, at six. I have, uh, uh, well, only five, okay. So I already mentioned that the ACH, uh, you, you saw it already, so it's a, a repetition. So, sorry or not sorry, but uh, here I give you this example as a that knowledge for different countries. Okay, we already saw that one, so I skip. So it's just for you, it's, uh, it's for you uh, that uh, we can, countries can decide to inscribe some sh something on the ICH and then maybe use it as a resources to promote it abroad. I have found two things, only two things for Pakistan. Two, only two. Falconry, okay, and frankly speaking, I'm still wondering why Belgium is a, is a, has a knowledge in falconry. I live in Belgium since 12 years, I never heard of that, but never mind. But at least falconry can be exported or can be promoted outside the country. It's not so complicated. You don't have to move the cathedral, or you don't have to move the temple, or you have to move the pagoda outside. And no rules. Have you, you know about no rules? Yeah. Yeah, he knows everything, but you, everyone knows about no rules? Yeah. And it's a joint, it's a, it's a joint Afghanistan, um, Azerbaijan, so all the countries in the region, including India, because it's uh, connected with um, Parsi, which is called uh, Zoroastrian. So is that a good idea? And I w and also it uh, coincides with Indian calendar. Yeah. Uh, also. Yeah, it coincides with Indian lunar calendar. Yeah. So which is already many Indian species. Oh, I didn't know. They are very slow calendar. It's a solar calendar. Yeah. And to give you an example. The five uh, countries of Central Asia are also following the rules. Kazakhstan, uh, Afghani uh, not Afghanistan, because they don't, they don't play with the group. But uh, the five uh, uh, European countries, they do an event together in Brussels. So as they say, we are celebrating together on the rules and we are invited. So it's a good idea. Why not to include India and Pakistan? I don't know. There is some sub-discussion, so that's going on. But let's, uh, let's make it happen. So Pakistan, uh, I have found on, on uh, uh, ICH only two resources for Pakistan. If they inscribe more, maybe they can do something. It means once again, once again, that each story can develop a narrative, whatever are the resources. Each country may, not should, we never say should, but we have to face reality. Of course, even if we are the world literature uh, um, um, uh, master, that states are competing together for images. States are competing together for their own images. Uh, you, you speak about Kowali? Not Kowali. Classical music. There was uh, Hindustani, the genre of Indian classical music. Pakistan used to be uh, many, many uh, traditions uh, started from Pakistan. Oh. We are living in India, present day India. Ah. Uh, and present day Pakistan and present day yes. India. Some yeah. of them are yeah. still alive, but that's a very powerful, intangible heritage of Pakistan. Some
Good. Good to hear. So, uh, so uh, just a summary to promote and to propose Buddhism a resource for image. Also very important to avoid an image elaborated by others because if one state doesn't promote its image, the image is elaborated by the other player, which are the media, the think tanks, and the NGOs. So, so it's also a challenge. Alors, in that case, China is doing quite well with a prime minister, which is always controlling its image and trying to impose it at the, at the, at the world level. So that case, India is clearly doing the job. So public image, diplomacy, and, and public diplomacy, image, and reputation. So beyond tourism towards public diplomacy, moving from cultural to resources, we always see that it could be used as a GNH, for example, by the MFA, a long-term strategy. It takes 10 years minimum. Nothing happened without 10 years at the global level if it's well coordinated. And the MFA should do the job under whatever, as already mentioned, whatever is the, 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 the party in power. Because if it changes after, after each uh, term, then it's collapse. Only, so that's clear? Okay, so it's uh, no time. It's time uh, for conclusion and maybe discussion. What have we seen during these uh, uh, four sessions during that week? Uh, it's a conclusion of the week, and then we are free to discuss together. Uh, we, there is no doubt. There is a possibility to move from epic to narrative, or to. Uh, to soft stories, to, to storytelling, to make it short, or even more to marketing. There is a possibility. And it, it's coherent within the uh, psychological approach of the, of the citizens. I argue in my book that citizens, uh, not citizens, human like stories. Forever, human like stories. We read books, we go to movies, we go to, to songs, like you have done yesterday, to hear stories or to dream about something. It's go, how it goes. It's forever. And it starts with epics. And now it's a, it's a continuation with uh, James Cameron or uh, Beyonce. <laughs> yeah, also, also. Some artists um, are able to develop something. Some, also, some other ones are just uh, the content is less but we don't judge that there is resources we can which can be to support and create stories but it could be like a scenarist is that a scenarist in english it's a screen screenwriter yeah it could be a screenwriter oh i sit on the table what are the resources to tell a new story of, of course we will ne will never make a confusion because it's stupid for that to articulate epics done in uh, ancient time with the work of a screenwriter, because it's a, uh, I consider that way it's importing marketing and creative modern techniques, and I don't like to make such connection. But it's possible to do something. Something I strongly believe, sometimes more than than the news, literature reflects the movement of the world. Now it's clear it's not new, of course. Uh, all the biggest uh, author, whatever is the country, are reflecting the, the movement, the question of the time, whatever is the question. It's reflecting the world sometimes with more accuracy than, uh, than uh, the news. We have a very, the most famous French writer uh, abroad, actually, is Michel Houellebecq. You know, who knows? You're the only, only one who knows Michel Welbeck. Michel Welbeck. You know him? Okay, whatever he's thinking is a very interesting writer because he reflects all the 
the yes, this kind of existential questions. So sometimes it's very, it could be very hopeful what is right, but it reflects some some something which sometimes are very dark inside us, really dark and, and desperate and with the problem of sexuality and and uh, and hope. Okay, but that's a reflection of the world. We can find in each of your country someone reflecting the world on a positive or negative manner, whatever it is, but it reflects the world. Also, of course, in that case, literature explains the society. Sorry, it's not clearly uh, written in English, but at least it explains the society. And we, I have a friend, we, we, sometimes we prefer to discuss about books than to read The Guardian or The Hindu Times or to other uh, Frankfurter Agamemnon Zeitung because it gives more details, more reality, more substance than the, the, the news. Of course, I always support the, the, the newspaper, the media, as a Democrat. The, and politics, Hello. here also, Hello. you, only two, three, you will vote in some days, I will vote in some days, I will vote in June, for European elections, and you will vote in June for, uh, and you will you will vote in November. You, you will vote in November. You will vote. Good. No abstention. Whatever it is, no abstention. This is my rule. So we will vote half of the half of the of the planet. No. Four billion and sixty countries are voting this year. Incredible. Uh, in Russia, we we already have the result, but whatever. People, why why do I speak about politics? Because literature tells stories, but also political parties tell stories. They were telling the stories, and if we have do a stay, I'm doing a, a lecture in BHU in a few days in, in Varanasi about European elections. What have I done? I'm trying to look about what are the party are telling about Europe. Which is, which future do we want? And it's the same for uh, uh, the Indian election and the same for uh, uh, US election. Which future do we want? It's not storytelling, but each president in your case and each uh, party, in my case, in our case, will tell stories, will promote arguments, and behind arguments there is values. And of course, it's a very huge uh, field of political communication, analyzing all the discourses which are done. And then we, could, we can do that. It's a good job for, a uh, good research field for people which are doing literature, because there is soft software to do that, to analyze the text, it's called so I'm not a specialist, it's close to linguistics. And I strongly believe, and this is my conclusion of my next book, and my forthcoming book, it's everything is related with identity. Who are we and who are, what are our identity today uh, transform through globalization, to make it short, whatever it is, our identity has to, or today transformed. So this is a huge, huge movement since 2010 or 2005, clearly visible since that moment. Would each of us here, who, uh, with whom are we connected? With what do we, with what or do we belong to? Is that correct in English? Which direction do we want to, to, to go? And which, which story are we sensible to? Which story do we agree with or disagree with? And we find that into politics, into literature, and into social media, and blah, 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 blah. So my conclusion is that whatever it is, words are here for stories. And whatever it could be, which could be the dimensions for individuals, for society, and for states, and for governments, and for political party, stories are here for, for reminding them. And also for creation, because sometimes we need some fresh air. Huh? We need some fresh air here. 
the fresh air from uh, <laughs> from uh, Rajgir, Nalanda. Huh? But the temperature is the same inside or outside. You, you stop the client, you, you stop the AC. Okay, thank you. And um, so go back to the topic. The, uh, I hope that during this uh, this uh, week, this four days, yeah, four days from one, from Tuesday to Friday, uh, I will, uh, you receive uh, clearly my message because it's uh, it's not a message, but it's it's a, my, it's a teaching and my words about that uh, communication is important, as we discussed this after this morning with a uh, with VC, and literature is a. Uh, a never-ending resource for thoughts and for uh, words and for uh, stories and and that's all. <laughs> I will not give more and more and more. But uh, 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 it was a pleasure to to, sing, to, to, to to teach in front of you. Once again, I am facing a different country of Asia or Europe uh, and Europe too. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. And uh, um, I, I thank you very much, my colleague, because it helps me, it uh, gives me the opportunity uh, to move fa forward into my research, to make new connections, and also then to nourish my uh, research and then to provide it to new students uh, year after year. That's a pleasure of research. And if you like research, please do your PhD and try to do that job. It's one of the jobs which gives you most freedom of thoughts and most freedom of, of time, whatever the constraints are. <laughs> IC, room, or administrative jobs. It's a very really good job. I think we can, I think, is there, is there any questions? Which movie? Online, on YouTube. Which country? Tibet. 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 And, in, and what's the Chinese connection? Like, uh, we get, I'm saying, Tibetans have used Buddhism as a soft power very clearly in order to grant Tibet as a separate nation, as a distinct nation, a distinct culture. And there is a uh, US and Chinese connection there that these two, these two are playing their role. What is the question? I don't get so the it. Question is On the Tibetan question? Yes. And in connection with the Buddhism, because China is also becoming claiming it, itself as a, uh, you know, as a propagator or a promoter of Buddhism. Which? Alors, China is pretty clear. Yeah, but in the last 10 years. Yeah, but ch Chinese, uh, alors, China promotes uh, Mahayana, I think, as, as far Tibetan. as I know. Yes. Tibetan, yeah. They, yes. they promote the both, I think. No? So I didn't know. I didn't. Um, I don't clearly agree with your point of view that uh, Tibet has used uh, Tibetan uh, um, um, uh, religion uh, uh, and Buddhism, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, as a soft power. I don't, I don't see it like this. I see that that the Dalai Lama, um, uh, uh, after 18, 1980, uh, 1989, 
1989, we received a Nobel Prize. Uh, he, uh, he, uh, he, he find that, uh, um, he realized that uh, um, uh, Buddhism was uh, um, a topic which can be um, from, uh, visible at the world level. But first, he never said that Tibet won, won, won should be independent. Then he, he, he never framed it, according to me, as a, as a strategic something. Okay, he knew that, he, uh, as you have read, that he was uh, traveling all around China, in Mongolia, in Borussia, in uh, all the country which are connection with Tibetan Buddhism to rejuvenate it and to, mo to, to modernize it, even in Bhutan, maybe. Uh, but I didn't, I never saw it like this. And um, yeah, that's my answer. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't, okay. yeah, that's true because uh, you may know uh, how deep uh, 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 your, this is your research field. In, I've learned one day when I was in China that there is a, uh, there is a, a, a university only devoted to counter uh, the, the, the argument of the, of the, um, of, of the Tibetans. It's in, it's in, uh, it's in uh, Beijing. There is a research center where the job is to day, year, on a year basis, to counter the information of this uh, so-called separatist uh, clique of Dalai Lama. This is the official world of the government. So, as far as I know, the, the Chinese logic, each time there is an argument popping up which is not into their favor, they create a research task and they do the counter argument. It's the same for the BRI. It's the same for soft power. When soft, when soft power, I switch to soft power. When soft power appears in 90, so in 1990, there was research center in China 10 years after to create a Chinese version of soft power. And they, they give definition. I, uh, this is in my book. You don't read French, unfortunately, but there is five pages on the Chinese definition of soft power. And they do the same for human rights, they do the same. They create, this is the only country in the world which is able through his researcher to create new concepts to oppose the concepts which are um, universally recognized, to make it short. Even if you, do, if you contest universality of the concept, they have a clear strategy to to counter this argument, which India don't do at all. France don't do that at all. We're, so that's why I, I uh, if you, maybe if you have read it like this, it's because of this uh, 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 Tibet, I don't know the na exact name, but uh, I remember, I've met one researcher looking at that. Uh, he was laughing and said, oh, the dilemma, this, uh, this, uh, he, he was not very um, polite with um, by giving giving some um, a negative adje adjective on him, and he was uh, laughing about how we will one day we will uh, succeed to to to, to something like this to remove the institution. So I think that we may consider the this this approach more clearly by by going deeper into a lot. Going deeper, that I know also. This is, I want to make an article on that. That there is a challenge to um, not to overcome, but there is a challenge to different. There is a challenge between Sri Lanka, China, and India to um, not control, but to uh, to claim or to push. Uh, Buddhism according to the vision of these three countries. This was in my second lecture, briefly, not yeah. too deserved. But there is a strategy of India, there is a strategy of China, there is a strategy of Sri Lanka for different reasons to claim that they are the source of the Buddhism or they still have the Buddhism 
exactly as the fighting against uh, for uh, uh, Islam between the uh, um, uh, uh, kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Morocco. You know, there is a fight between the two. They are both Sunni, and sometimes also maybe uh, Bahrain or Qatar, something they claim that they have the origin, origin one. Of course, they have a, a kingdom of Saudi Arabia as a holy uh, Mecca, but the king, the king of, uh, of Morocco is a di descending of the prophet. So this is a similar challenge, which is quite interesting as a researcher to, to analyze. No, I didn't discuss about it. Can you throw some light to what this? But transliterate, transliterators, you mean the people which were trying to explain Buddhism? Those explain Buddhism and they were the uh, people those who were translating Buddhist literature, uh, traditional Buddhist literature yeah. for Europeans in different languages. Yes. So then two types of narrative got developed. Finally, the Franco Belgian narrative did not. Like, there were few, but now and, uh, this became dominant. Do you, do you, uh, are you able to quote some names? Uh, so for example, this Anglo-German, uh, this Max Muller, and uh, <coughs> these are, and for Franco-Belgian, uh, there is Derabala Kose, Selgan Levy. Derabala? Alors, um, these are big names, right? Yeah, I, I, may, I may know some of these names, but you, uh, I, I reach one limit that I am not able to argue on that. Because I know how the, 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 uh, the uh, analyze of Buddhism arrived in Europe, because as a general knowledge, but I don't know the difference of the schools. You see what I mean? I didn't, I, I, didn't know, I didn't know that you, you, how it was done. And I'm, of course, uh, um, um, uh, depending my French heritage, where I know more about the French ones. So these are, that's why these are French. Or the, 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 write the names here. Yeah. OK, I'll give you my book when, when these uh, discussions are there. So oh, OK, 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 so thank you. But um, uh, I don't know any details. Uh, uh, this more scholarly details, and I know more about general public uh, uh, movement when it arrived within the society, when it was considered as a as a something which was nihilist uh, because of emptiness, and when it was something considered as a uh, non-efficient because it was um, a visible, it was not so uh, so organized and powerful than Christianism, and there was also something which uh, Buddhism was considered as a as uh, um, also when Buddhists arrived in, in 90, the French, the first, the first monks which arrived in, in, in Europe is uh, uh, um, uh, to settle, uh, it was in 1967 in Scotland. And uh, uh, it bring Buddhism and it was um, uh, of course connected with the hippie movement and all the so people. The, these monks are 19th century. Yeah, okay, I don't know any more details, sorry. One remaining question? Uh, no, 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 Oh, 
comments that is intellectuals that is religious institutions that is or people that is because uh, if we if we in, in in the context of uh, it's a question or yes, it's a it's statement a question, it's a question so okay. in the context of foreign policy so if we undermine the uh, like structure of presence for example if we take the uh, pakistan uh, example so the structure of present day is something very different and uh, they are evoking the narrative from the past so how is it is it going to work for Pakistan? No, no, Pakistan, like any country, it, uh, when we are talking about narrat uh, like narrating and making an epic, <laughs> whose epic is this? Oh, no, this is two different questions. Whose epic is this and uh, uh, um, dealing with the past? Uh, question of identity, okay, we can also uh, use the past to know ourselves, but not to be frozen in the past, like some countries are. Yeah. But uh, I argue that one country should never rely on only one resources, like the French wine, for example, the French uh, perfume, which has cliché, but it's all resources. So that's why EPIC can be used as a part of a public diplomacy and as a resources combined with other ones. And we already have the case of Bhutan, three different resources for one country. So it works. So EPIC is not using the past and being frozen in the past and doing do, being the only resources first second one would it this it depends on the on the the the, the room of maneuver the government gives because it could be a pick done by a writer maybe that is ready to write 1000 pages which will become a milestone for 10 some years ago then it could be also done by the government to promote itself. So your question, according to me, uh, is trying to put things into boxes. Maybe it's, not, it, maybe it's useless. Give some flexibility to different uh, protagonists in one society to, 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 tell, to, to tell one epic or to tell one big stories. Like, uh, uh, I think, uh, Philip Roth, in a very famous writer of the US, is describing the US society. Mm -hmm. Maybe, sorry for that shortcut, consider that as a kind of epics of today. But, but he has the freedom to do that because he's a writer. And there is be, uh, if there is an alignment between all this kind of uh, initiative, in that case, we may, we may go into uh, a very authoritarian country. She has a question. So yeah. Laura, and is this a ping pong? Yeah. Ping pong diplomacy. <laughs> no, I was thinking of the question of uh, resource power and this kind of epic. If there is, could be an epic for the foreigners and an epic of, for the country, you know? If they have to be in the same narrative, or maybe for Africa you can have an, an specific epic that maybe is not the main values of the I disagree with that because we have a risk of lack of coherence. Yeah. Because yeah. it will be one day, uh, because of digital media, because of digital, it will be visible. And the epic, if we are close to the uh, first idea, the epic uh, 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 defines the country. Mm. It's a kind of heritage, it's a kind of ground, uh, roots, sorry, roots. Okay. So in that case, it, it defines. So I uh, strongly argue for coherence, but one part could be one target, one part could be another target, and also sometimes K-pop or music could be an, for another target. But the ground should may rely on that, with, uh, without while avoiding nationalism. Oh, we have the best story of the world. We have the so best solution for the world. In that case, it's nationalism, and nationalism is closing the door. Good evening, everyone. So on behalf of all my classmates and on behalf of Nalanda University, of course, uh, I would like to extend our deepest gratitude to our esteemed 
visiting lecturer, Professor Olivier Arifon. Uh, we are truly honored to have had the opportunity to learn from someone as distinguished and accomplished as yourself. Well, uh, formation of EPIC as national identity in Korea in modern times was our first lecture where we discussed on diplomacy, EPIC diplomacy, implementing public diplomacy, etc. Then discuss, discussion on EPIC dimension of Buddhism as a discourse for cultural transaction beyond boundaries was another interesting topic where we got to know about branches of Buddhism, stories of meaning, storytelling, and epic, Buddhism for cultural transaction, etc. Then uh, yesterday we learned about uh, the possibility of using other resources for research, not just academic, but open resource intelligence, um, followed by the workshop, and then uh, today's lecture. So once again, uh, thank you, Professor Olivier, for gracing us with your presence and for your invaluable contribution to our learning journey. We look forward to the possibility of welcoming you back in the future. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I have to be thankful for Professor Sushant sir for giving this great opportunity for us. It was really an uh, interesting experience for us, I think. And uh, thank you, Doctor, for spending your valuable time with us for four days. Thank you again. Uh, we expect again uh, here at least once, I think. It was most interesting about that.